Um, and some of what um, I'm sharing with you today shouldn't be too unfamiliar because I've already heard a variety of versions of it um, in the other speakers. So um, we'll see how we go. The title at the moment, the working title of my thesis, is Graced Encounters of an Ecological Kind, Exploring an Ignatian Motif. The current ecological crisis presents a complex array of causes and consequences which call forth a cry of the earth and a cry of the poor. For theologians, responding to these cries demands a theological response. Part of this response will be a theology of the natural world as the place of encounter with God. On Tuesday morning this week, sitting on the back patio of a Mercy House in Adelaide, whilst finishing my morning cuppa and taking a quick look through my emails, an image and a headline in Eureka Street caught my attention. Eureka Street is a Jesuit publication. It was about one such encounter of an ecological kind, in my opinion, as told by Julie Perrin of an experience she had with her husband. She entitled it The Rosella's Last Walk, an eco parable. I've shortened it here due to time. On Monday morning, sorry, on Monday evening following Easter Sunday, we go for a walk along a cliff top above the 90 mile beach in East Gippsland, Victoria. This stretch of land is deeply familiar to my husband, a place where remnant bush edges up to domestic house blocks and stretches down to the beach below. The tea tree and banksia bushland forms part of the scant wild space remaining in coastland slowly eroded by development. Andy, my husband, walks not far ahead of me. At the threshold of the bushland, he ducks under a tea tree bush. As I stoop to follow him, a small movement on the grass catches my attention. At the corner of the house block, on the cusp of the bushland, are two brightly coloured birds. A vibrant lime green bird with blue and red markings at its throat lies prone unmoving in the grass. The other bird, in the familiar reds and blues of the crim crimson rosella, is scrabbling along the ground some inches from its companion. I speak my husband's name. He stops and turns. Look, I whisper. His eyes follow my hand and take in the birds on the grass. One probably dead, the other twisted with injury. Andy steps out of the tea tree and lifts his eyes, scanning the house and yard. No obvious cause of injury is visible. The bright green bird lies utterly still in the late afternoon light, showing no signs of life. But the rout rosella keeps lifting its wing, right wing, then its tail, fanning the blue feathers and collapsing them. It scrabbles with its right claw, grabbling at the grass, propelling itself towards its companion. My husband and I glance at each other and down at the birds again. As the rosella convulsively fans its tail up and out, we see the cemetery of the underside. Light blue feathers with dark blue outline, packed neatly and splayed evenly. The tail repeatedly bursts up and fans open and closes and drops down. Beauty and desperation in one awkward rearing motion. We stand close and unmoving. Everything stops except the bird on the ground. 
the rosella finishes traversing those few inches of grass and reaches its companion. It rests its craning head on the ground, beak to beak, with the other bird. There is no more heaving. The rosella lifts its wing and lays it along the prone body of the bright bird. The open wing lies like a mantle over the dead bird, covering all but its head and tail. Once in this position, the crimson bird raises and releases its tail in frail salute. After this, the only movement is a little shudder of air, the last breath of the rosella. As Andy and I stood up from stooping towards the birds, our arms brush, we are reluctant to leave. Shyly we ask one another, did that just happen? We walk quietly into the tunnel of tea trees towards gnarled and ageing banks here and then back along the beach below. The next morning we return to find the birds where we last saw them. We photographed them from above in beak to beak intimacy. Checking the tattered bird's identification book, we learned that the bright green bird is a juvenile rosella. When we leave them, the two birds remain there undisturbed on the grass at the cliff top, the wind riffling the wing feathers of the adult bird. Just take a moment to connect with your inner response as you now reflect on the story you have just heard. What stirs in you? I was moved at a deep level. I felt something at a gut level. Compassion for the birds but in particular for the bird who struggled to reach its companion, probably offspring. My heart, mind and body felt something that resonated with my faith in a God who loves all created life. Something about feeling for the suffering of this creature, but also awe and wonder at the desire in the bird to be with its companion, to offer its wing as a mantle, almost as if in embrace a desire to be with the other in this moment of transition from life to death to life. For me, this story is an image of graced encounters of an ecological kind, encountering God in the relationship that now existed between the two birds, the storyteller and me, an interconnectedness that only God's grace can bring about. I received the story and image as a gift, as grace from God whom I, whom I encountered there. When I encounter God in this way, it has the potential of transformation. Something in me shifts. My inner being expands and with it, my capacity for life and love. The encounter embraces all that is broken and makes it whole. It is as if the resurrected Christ reaches out and sweeps me up in an embrace of love that heals and renews. Can I believe that God does this also for the creatures and plants of the earth, the earth itself? Crying out for mercy, for love, is this not what we are called to do, be presence of God for all creation through our action in these troubled times? God's grace is a sign of hope, a loving promise that all is not lost. My PhD thesis takes in the work of Ignatius Loyola, a 16th century saint, Karl Rahner, a 20th century theologian who was also a Jesuit or, um, of the Ignatian persuasion, Dennis Edwards, who was a Ranarian scholar, and Pope Francis, who is also a Jesuit. 
and traces their work at a well-established central motive in Ignatian spirituality, the practice of finding God in all things. My focus is finding God in the natural world. I believe that this Ignatian motif has the potential to create a way of being, <coughs> of intention or orientation towards God, an awareness of God in all of life that is vitally important in our attempts to respond to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. It also promotes a contemplative awareness of God's presence that could provide sustenance and support for the action required. Ignatius invites us to see how God dwells in, labours in all creatures and living things. Karl Rahner boldly states that grace is everywhere as an active orientation of all created re reality towards God. Grace does not happen in isolated instances here and there in an otherwise profane and graceless world. Pope Francis implores us to understand that our insistence that each human being is in an image of God should not make us overlook the fact that each creature has its own purpose. None is superfluous. The entire material universe speaks of God's love. And Dennis Edwards reflects on Laudato Si, saying, in these creatures, Francis points out, we encounter God's Holy Spirit. Francis, he, he says, this, says the spirit of life dwells in them and in our encounter with them we are invited into relationship with this indwelling and life-giving spirit of God. This theological response is part of an ongoing development of the theology of the natural world that brings hope to the senseless suffering heard in the cries of the earth and the cries of the poor. The encounter is in the beauty and the suffering. God's grace is everywhere, in every moment, every experience. We only need to be open to see it. Louis Schwartzberg expresses something of this beautifully in this one minute, 47 second clip. When I graduated UCLA, I moved to Northern California and I lived in a little town called Elk on the Mendocino coast. I didn't have much money, but I had time and a sense of wonder. So I started shooting time-lapse photography. It would take me a month to shoot a four-minute roll of film because that's all I could afford. I've been shooting time-lapse flowers continuously, non-stop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for over 30 years. And to see them move is a dance I'll never get tired of. Their beauty immerses us with color, taste, touch. It also provides a third of the food we eat. Beauty and seduction is nature's tools for survival because we protect what we fall in love with. It opens our hearts and makes us realize we are a part of nature and we're not separate from it. When we see ourselves in nature, it also connects us to every one of us because it's clear that it's all connected in one. When people see my images, a lot of times they'll say, oh my God. Have you ever wondered what that meant? The O oh means it caught your attention, it makes you present, it makes you mindful. The my means it connects with something deep inside your soul. It creates a gateway for your inner voice to rise up and be heard. And God, God is that personal journey we all want to be on, to be inspired to feel like we're connected to a universe that celebrates life. The images of the two Rosellas on Tuesday morning was an OMG moment. A graced encounter that calls me to understand more deeply that I am so integrally connected to all of life that I can't ignore the call to honour it with my considered response to do what I can to live more ecologically.